The interferon class of medicines are the first medicines we developed in MS, and they were originally intended to treat MS as a viral infection. It turns out that these probably don't work as an antiviral, but instead work directly on the immune system through the interferon receptor to lead to immune modulating effects, downregulation of inflammatory cytokines, and other immune system response. Letirum or acetate was originally developed in the laboratory to induce MS in animals. What was found surprisingly is that it didn't induce MS in animals, but instead prevented MS in animals and treated an animal model of MS. Glutirum or acetate is a random polypeptide based on four amino acids that are contained in the myelin protein. Myelin is the sheath that surrounds axons, of course. And Glutirum or acetate is a random polymer of about 40 to 80 amino acids in length of a random assortment of those four amino acids. And the way it works is not entirely known, but is probably a combination of an immune mimic to induce tolerization against myelin peptides. It may compete in the MHC class one uh, molecule to compete out myelin peptides so that myelin peptides are not presented to the immune system. It also induces regulatory response. So this so-called Th2 down-regulatory response and protective cytokines that decrease inflammation and may actually induce neuroprotection. When we think about the different classes of MS therapies, the injectables is where we start because historically they were the first to develop. They are generally modestly effective. They clearly have efficacy, but their efficacy is limited. And their tolerance is also limited because their injections the interferons induce flu-like side effects. Glutirum or acetate induces skin reactions and divots in the skin. So tolerance is variable. Now, some patients, these drugs work well and are tolerated well, but in a lot of patients, it either is insufficient or their side effects are not sufficiently tolerated. Oral therapies, such as dimethylfumarate and fegolimod and saponamod, appear to be more effective than the injectables, and as an oral therapy, are often more acceptable to patients uh, given their oral administration compared to injections. They are generally considered to be more effective than the injectable therapies, although they have a little bit more safety concerns. So there are more safety concerns in terms of GI side effects, lowering of the white blood cell count, increased risk of infections, depending on which medicine we're referring to. That said, in general, many neurologists are using the oral drugs ahead of the injectable drugs because of their better efficacy and their better acceptance profile with patients. Infusion therapies, are generally considered to be more effective than the oral therapies, although there are some patients who are fully controlled with their MS, with the oral therapies, or even the injection therapies. Nonetheless, patients who don't tolerate or don't respond sufficiently to the oral or injectable therapies, infusion therapies are a very good option. They are very highly effective and uh, are generally safe, although do have some safety concerns. A big question in the field is whether the infusion therapies, those highly effective therapies, are the best therapies to start with right at the beginning of MS. Or is it better to start with a lower effective drug, such as an injectable or an oral therapy, and then move up to the infusion therapies as needed, depending on patient tolerability or disease activity? There's some evidence from the rheumatology literature that treating rheumatoid arthritis is better to start with aggressive therapy right out of the gate. And that is what has gotten us in the MS field wondering if that's the same, uh, if we should be doing the same thing. There are a few studies ongoing now which are asking exactly that question, randomizing patients to the very highly effective versus the modestly effective therapy and following them over the long term to see how the patients do. And so we await the results of those studies before we really know which is the best thing to do at the time of diagnosis. One could, under the right circumstances, use almost any of our given agents 
as a first line therapy. I think early on, you wanna make sure that you're maintaining safety, but you also need to maintain efficacy. And, and one of the challenges to the clinician is trying to gauge the individual prognosis of a patient. And we're not very good at it, but nevertheless, we do it. And so someone who comes in, even with a first attack, that was really a bad attack and they have lots of activity on their MRI scan um, and they haven't made a good recovery, uh, one would use a more aggressive, highly effective therapy there. On the other hand, uh, there's other times when you could use almost any of the agents, the orals are, are a good starting point. Um, one of the things that one has to take into consideration, what's the patient interested in taking? So some patients are more concerned with safety than they are with efficacy. And so we have to meet their needs as well by giving them an agent that they're comfortable taking. The decision-making process is long. It takes us about an hour to go through this with a patient. Because again, we have to assess what we think the aggressiveness is of their course, what risks and side effects they're willing to take or not willing to take, what drug administration route they prefer, whether it be injectable, uh, intravenous, or oral. Again, family planning. Comorbidities is, is a very important thing. You know, do they have other diseases like diabetes or heart disease, um, liver disease, things that may affect the choice of your agent. Um, so all these are considerations in choosing, and, and just about all the drugs are on the table. So there's no one, and there shouldn't be, any one drug that someone always starts with. There ought to be a, a tailored conversation with the individual to come up with the right drug for them.